Now let's welcome in Oklahoma State's head coach, Mike Boynton, to the 24-7 Sports Social Distance Series. Mike, thanks for joining us, man. Uh, how you doing? I'm doing okay. I've, uh, I've probably had better weeks uh, <laughs> in my life, certainly, but I'm a pretty optimistic person. Yeah. Um, I try to be positive as much as possible. Uh, and I understand that things happen out of your control sometimes and you got to deal with adversity at other times. And, you know, you just got to find a way to keep on moving forward. So all in all, I'm doing well. Appreciate you asking. What, what, what you're referring to is obviously what came down from the NCAA uh, hitting your program pretty heavy, giving you a, a postseason ban, uh, a reduction of scholarships and, and another uh, of other penalties. What, Mike, what was your reaction when you heard the news or when you saw the email from the NCAA uh, giving you those punishments? Well, it was kind of disbelief. Um, I was shocked at the, the severity of the penalties. You know, obviously I, I went into a pretty eyes wide open. I know I knew we had been under investigation. Uh, and, and this is kind of a unique uh, precedent in many yeah. ways. I don't know of any investigation from the NCAA that was essentially kick-started by the FBI, <laughs> right? So uh, made our situation, because of its connection to those other cases, uh, very difficult to, to kind of decipher because many times, if you would read articles when they were written, it basically kind of lumped them all together. Right. right? These cases kind of started from that SDNY uh, thing two, three years ago now. Um, but, you know, the thing that was disappointing to me was I, from what I understand, each case is supposed to be taken on its own merits, right? right? Unless, if, if not, then we should all have been on trial together, if that's right. the case, right? But if you do what you say you're doing and you're taking these cases individually, when you look at our case, the facts of our case just don't justify the punishment that was, that was laid out. Uh, we had an individual person involved in some activities, um, we never had it. We never had a recruiting uh, violation in this deal. No recruiting violations. We never played an ineligible player. We don't have anybody else on our staff or within our program that was also involved in this. I'm talking as much as a conversation. Right. About, um, there's no lack of institutional control. We showed that we have an atmosphere of compliance. The whole deal. You know, all the things that would be alarm bells if this was a major issue here. So it was a pretty isolated deal. Um, and to make it basically um, as harsh of a punishment, in my view, as you can hand out uh, right. based on those facts is you know, pretty stunning, especially considering the people that it's going to impact, right? Of course. Uh, so in 2016 and 17, while Lamont was an assistant coach here and these activities were going on, there's not a single player on my roster who was, I don't even know, considering Oklahoma State yet at that time. Right. Um, and now, all these years later, those guys essentially have to bear the brunt of yeah. you know, what I think is a pretty far overreach. You, you mentioned you being in disbelief, and you mentioned um, these players that weren't around um, for, for the violations. W what was your message to your guys? Like, how, how did you go about approaching uh, this conversation with them? Because I'm sure there was a lot of upset kids. Yeah, I mean, so, so I'll go back a little bit. It's not like they didn't know, right? I still had to recruit these guys, honestly, through this process. So for three years, everybody that's being recruited, you know, and obviously my competitors are telling them, hey, they're under investigation. I want you to know that. So we didn't hide from the fact that we were under investigation or that we may have some sort of sanctions coming down. Uh, but again, the, the level of sanction, the severity and the harshness of them was something that I had to kind of wrestle with. I called every single player on our roster immediately upon finding out, um, starting with Cade and Farron Flavors, the two guys who you would imagine have the most at stake for this coming year. Right. Cade, with obviously understanding that he's only going to be in college for one year in most cases, unless something catastrophic happens. And then Farron Flavors with only one year of eligibility left as a grad transfer. Uh, and just told those guys, hey, I know this isn't the, what you thought you had signed up for. Uh, in many ways, a big part of playing in college is having the opportunity to play an NCAA tournament. Of course. Um, and I want you here. I do understand, however, that you both will have other options. If that's something that's that important and critical, uh, I'll say I don't know how the appeals process will play out, the length of it or anything like that, but we're going to appeal. 
Um, so it's, it's not a for sure. It could get overturned, right? It, maybe the appeal goes long enough where, you know, it doesn't impact this this season. I don't know that. Uh, but I do want to be upfront and honest with them that that's a possibility. They could come here and this year wouldn't be able to play in the state tournament. So uh, I told them all, every one of them, that I support them. I want to help them and their families through this process. I want to be able to provide as much accurate information as possible. Because what happens now is, you know, they were all kind of thrown in a little bit of a state of confusion. Of course. And, and with the pandemic and everybody being in different places, their information is coming from all over. Yeah. <laughs> and and some of it coming from other schools. Hey, you know, they don't have a scholarship for you. They don't, they're not gonna be able to play in the tournament. And and it's, you know, it's just the nature of our business. So it's just been a lot of consistent communication about yeah. Here are the real facts, and here's what we think we're going to go be able to fight against. Of course. You, you mentioned um, the appeal, and you guys put out a release very shortly after the NCAA uh, released um, the punishments. In, in your eyes, uh, what, what's your case here, and, and what's going to be your all's approach with the NCAA in, the, in an attempt to, to get this overturned and, and go about this appeal process? Well, I don't know if we've got a – um, a final plan of, uh, in terms of a strategy yet. What I do know is our, our major beef is we've apparently been lumped in in a group of cases which have several different factors in each right. one. And it seems as though that's the way they were approached this. If at some point we have to punish another school for being involved in this down the road, then we can't say your case was any different, when in fact it is. Uh, and like I said, if we were going to all be dealing with the same punishment, then we should all have been going through this process the same. These processes are all taking pay place at very different uh, stages, right? Yeah. Uh, some people have received notices of allegations. Some people haven't even gotten that far yet. And we're three years later. So uh, I think our approach is just trying to get them to understand why the level of punishment doesn't fit the level of, of, of actual problems here at Oklahoma State. Of course. If they could say, you guys have shown a lack of institutional control, this was a collective effort, a bunch of, a, a, um, with a bunch of people involved. You got players running around here with fancy cars and, and they're ineligible and we can trace back where money's been given out. All right, but none of those things exist. In their own report, they basically state we found an individual acting in his own self-interest to no advantage to the university. Well, then the <laughs> university is now paying the price for all right. the activity. Of um, so that, that's probably the crux of it. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how it plays out over the next couple months. One of the things you mentioned was um, the players that are on your roster, the players that you've recruited, weren't around for, for any of this. And it, it's, I understand the NCAA has to come down with punishments for uh, wrongdoings, but it just doesn't sit well with me uh, when, when guys are paying the price that weren't there um, for everything that, that, that had happened. No, I, I agree. And, and I think if you would poll all the people on the committee who made this decision, and ask them why they work in college athletics. They would look you square in the eye and without blinking tell you they are in this to help kids. Right. And provide opportunities uh, and put them on place, put them in position to have success and understand what it's like. Well, this flies in the face of helping kids. You explain to me how taking away scholarship opportunities and taking them away from being able to perform at the highest level of our game is really good for them. Um, how could, because Kay's been talked about a lot in this deal. Yeah. He was 14 years old when this activity was going on. How could he, as a freshman in high school, feel like he needs to factor in, hey, you know what, four years from now, I may not be able to play an NCAA tournament because of something that's going on at a school out there right now. And, and if that's the what, what they're saying, they're going to cause a lot of issues within the membership, I would imagine. For sure. You know, talking about Cade and, and the reason that he's such a big topic, he's the number one player uh, in the country, uh, a big-time talent. Uh, his brother, Cannon, is on your staff. 
uh, you were you were quoted um, not too long after this came out of, of saying that you encouraged him to kind of examine his options and look at his situation. Where, where does all that sit right now? What, what have your conversations with Cade been like? And and can you kind of summarize where, where things stand with him? Yeah, when I say it's about kids, I mean it. And and my actions in many cases, as, as you'll you'll probably see, without I don't know how much turnover we'll have in our roster to be perfectly honest uh, but obviously he's a person that a lot of people are curious as to what he'll do and so I meant what I said I want to know that if he comes to Oklahoma State he's coming at it understanding he can still accomplish a lot of things there may be something that's been taken off the table but our communication has been consistent and clear and honest the same way it was since I started recruiting him when he was a freshman at Arlington Bowie High School in 2016. Here's where I think I can help provide uh, opportunities to help you get better. Here's where I think Oklahoma State can help you as you move forward in your, your development. Uh, and here are some things that you need to consider with these other options. And I think every option you could imagine is on the table for him. There's right. probably several teams in Europe or other continents that would love for him to come over and play for the year. I'm sure the G League would accept him with open arms. I know that there was a preliminary conversation already in the past. Um, and obviously any other school in the country would take them. <laughs> uh, and even if they were maxed out in scholarships right now, they should figure it out. Yeah, they're probably creating one for them. <laughs> uh, so he's probably uh, got the most options of anybody. And because of the way I try to recruit from such an honest standpoint, I didn't want to try to make him feel pressured to do this for me. This is truly about his career. I still think there's a lot of great things that we could do together. Uh, with the team that I think we can still have. Uh, and even in a worst case scenario where we don't get an overturn on this decision, you know, the NCAA tournament is something that as great as it is, it's not the end of the world for him. Of course. Right? He still has a lot of basketball future. Um, and so there's still a lot of things he can do here, but I just want him to feel totally comfortable if he shows up on campus that his heart is still in it. Has he given you any kind of indication on when he might come to a conclusion or make a decision? I know this happened recently. Yeah, we, we haven't really talked about a date. Um, what we've done the last week, and I guess it's been a week today since this news came out, is let's gather all the information and yep. let's put them on the table. You know, it's no different than when he went through the recruiting process, Ev. Mm -hmm. um, he took all five visits, even though his brother was here, be, partly because we encouraged that. We didn't want, and we knew the narrative wouldn't change. Right. But we wanted his heart to be set on, that's where I want to be. Yep. So go visit Kentucky for Big Blue Madness. Don't go visit on some off football weekend when they're not doing anything. Like, go go when it's the best. Right. Go to Kentucky, uh, North Carolina when they've got late night with Roy. When, when all eyes and go enjoy the entire atmosphere of this recruitment that you can. Yep. And when you strip everything away from an emotional standpoint, what do you think is best? And that's how we got to the place where he called and made the decision that he wanted to be here. You know, he's, four hours home. You know, he's basically, in, in many ways, he's a Big 12 kid, right? He grew up in Dallas. Sure. His dad played at Texas Tech. His brother played at SMU right there. If he sticks with this, he's going to play a game against TCU in Fort Worth. He's going to play a game against Baylor in Waco. He's going to play a game against Texas in Austin. Yeah, he's going to play the other half of his games in Stillwater, which is a four hour drive from his home. His brother's here. There's still a lot of positive things. Um, and so, you know, I just want him to make sure he understands. If he's coming, we're still going to coach him. We're going to try to push him and make him his best because his his goals won't change no matter where he goes. Yeah, we got to continue to provide opportunities for him to achieve those for sure. Mike, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you about everything that's going on in our country, the, the social injustice, uh, racism. W what have your conversations on these topics been like with your team? And what's the message uh, that you tried to give your guys? Well, I think it's just been about listening and understanding different people do things differently. And it doesn't make us enemies. It actually makes us really unique. It makes this country special uh, because we're allowed in our country to worship differently. Um, we're allowed to have different family beliefs. Um, you know, my wife grew up in Michigan and her family ate dinner at 530 
at 5.30, my mom wasn't even getting close to the kitchen. <laughs> and it's okay, right? We right. figured out a way to make it work because there's true love there, right? Yep. Um, and so it's just been about being aware of these things. Mm -hmm. This movement, because I do think it's a movement, is different than some of the other ones because of the uh, almost unanimous sense that we need to really move the ball forward this time. Change. Yeah. And, and so we have an opportunity if we, if we don't just let this one fizzle out to really impact change. And you impact change by continuing to let your voice be heard, uh, continuing to listen to the concerns and, and uh, problems that other people have, but also by challenging your inner circle, right? That's where you can make the most significant change is the people you're around every day. Um, and we have to stop being so defensive when we hear things that we don't like. Right. Really what people are saying is you need to challenge yourself to think about whether you are participating in this. You know, one of the things that have come up is this Black Lives Matter uh, statement. Just, just those three words themselves. Just think about Black Lives Matter. And people take offense when they hear that. Right. Which, in my mind, doesn't make sense because their counter to that is all lives matter. Right. Sure. Right. Granted, I, I agree. But you don't think all lives matter if you can't accept that black lives matter. Right. In essence, if you say all lives matter, then you're also saying black lives matter. <laughs> and yeah. you can't escape that. And right now what we're saying is this, this, it's not the police. I think that's the problem. We overgeneralize. Yeah. There are police officers and there is poor training in some police departments. And we have to call those things out and demand that those activities change uh, because if kneeling isn't enough and then walking and marching isn't enough, then people resort to something else to get your attention. Yeah. And I don't condone it. I think it's kind of counterproductive to make damage to property in your own neighborhood. But I understand how if you're not going to listen to me, then you'll probably at least respond to something else. Um, but I think we have a great opportunity if we continue these conversations, if we acknowledge that this didn't just start in 2020. This started when our country began as it was originally, when people were able to own other people. So there was already an inherent thought process as there's a group of people who aren't as important as the others because we get to own them. And then we went from there to segregation and then Jim Crow and and we've gotten better. And our job, my take, my per personal responsibility in here is Dr. King and Rosa Parks and Harriet Tubman and Satchel Page in sports and Jackie Robinson broke barriers and helped put me in position where my life is so much better than theirs was. Well, how do I do the same thing for my son? Right. How do I do the same thing for his children? And what are the sacrifices that maybe I need to make? How do I stand up and take a stance um, and say, I don't want this for my kids. I, I may not benefit from the change right now, but it's important that, you know, Colin and, you know, people are offensive by Colin Kaepernick, but yeah, he sacrificed. They can say whatever they want. He basically sacrificed his career for this yeah. movement. And he could have very easily gone away and been quiet, but he said, you know what, 50 years from now, someone's going to have a better opportunity because I took a knee today. Right. You know, you, sports has a way of unifying people. And I, I think you, you, you touched on a lot of great points, particularly basketball and, and sports. What role do you think it could have in, in helping the, the country move forward in terms of unifying and, and really fighting racism? You know, I, I truly believe this in my heart. Sports could and should take the lead here. Wow. Because it's, it's really in many ways – one of the few areas where people accept each other without knowing all those background dynamics. Yeah. And usually friendships are built in sports that would hardly ever be able to be built in other places. And you know, I think we need to continue to think about ourselves as we can be the example. We can be united, you know, white athletes, black athletes. I play with guys from all over the world from all different parts of the country, who again, grew up very different than I did. And that's why it bothers me when I hear people say, stick to sports. 
when in fact, we, we shouldn't have sports looking out on the world. We should have the world looking into sports as what the world can be if people would just put aside their differences and understand that we're working together. Because in essence, that's what teams do. Sure. We don't worry about our differences. We don't worry about your strengths are different from mine. Well, how do we put those things together to, to help our team have success? And so I think sports should and, and certainly could and should take the lead in, in, in making change. Yeah, that's great stuff. Mike, man, I, I really appreciate you taking out the time and, and, uh, and jumping on here with me, man. Thank you. I appreciate it, Ev.